Uh, welcome back, everyone, uh, from that very brief uh, break to our second uh, panel of the day. Um, we have uh, three speakers who have each been asked to prepare uh, seven to ten minutes um, to speak on, on a very focused um, topic. And uh, we have some time for discussion afterwards. Uh, and I'll introduce each of the speakers. So um, the first uh, presenter this morning is uh, Marie de Susson. Sorry if I've butchered the pronunciation of your name. You can <laughs> repeat it and correct me. Uh, who is um, a part of the domestic climate change adaptation team at DEFRA. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rodney. Um, yes, it's uh, de Soisson, but it's a it's a bit of an unusual one. So you're certainly not the not the first, and you got a pretty good start at it. Um, so thank you very much, Hannah, for um, inviting me to present um, to all of you today. Um, so as Rodney kindly uh, mentioned, I work in DEFRA's domestic climate change adaptation policy team. So I've very much interpreted the title today in terms of relating the importance of natural and cultural capital to developing resilience to climate change. And I'm absolutely delighted that um, there's been some strong emphasis this morning in terms of really needing to accept and identify the inevitable change that's going to happen from climate change, of course, as well as needing to maintain that degree of ambition towards um, mitigation and reducing our emissions. And so when I think about natural and cultural capital, I'm very much interpreting uh, capital beyond the kind of monetary sense to be really thinking about those wider benefits to, for example, mental and physical health and well-being, community resilience to climate change risks, um, knowledge sharing, as well as, of course, their own intrinsic importance. And just to check that I hope that um, everybody can see as I'm switching the slides, but flag if not. Um, so looking at how climate change fits within uh, government, as many of you will be aware, the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy is the overall government lead for reducing emissions. Um, and so they do that through their own sectors, but they also drive uh, delivery across government. Each department has got their own responsibilities in reducing their carbon. Uh, and DEFRA uh, has their own responsibilities in reducing carbon in the natural environment sectors, so things like agriculture and forestry. And uh, in a similar vein, DEFRA is the government lead for uh, responding and preparing to climate change risks. Uh, and likewise, we coordinate and we uh, deliver uh, adaptation action through our own sectors, but we also really try and drive action across departments in that recognition that climate change is not just an environmental problem. It's something that's going to affect, um, as Caitlin has really astutely pointed out earlier, it's going to affect all sectors of society, be that infrastructure, business, um, transport, etc. And so we really try and emphasize that. And then we also work closely with our mitigation colleagues um, to really think about how we can reduce the trade-offs between mitigation and adaptation, such as land use competition, um, but also really um, trying to ma um, magnify the synergies between the two. So, for example, when we think about tree planting, we're not just thinking about carbon sequestration, but we're thinking about the right species of trees in the right types of places so that we can deliver those wider biodiversity benefits, as well as uh, resilience to uh, climate change risks to communities. So things like natural flood management, uh, natural urban cooling, uh, et cetera. Um, so this is just a very rough overview of what our statutory duties are for adaptation uh, within the Climate Change Act. Um, so as you can see, we have a five yearly program uh, around the evidence and science of how um, the climate is changing and what risks and impacts that's going to have on the UK. Um, and that is direct, uh, directly responded to uh, by a five yearly national adaptation program, which you can see in the green boxes. Um, which are a direct response to uh, the risks that are highlighted in the climate change risk assessment in the blue boxes. And um, as I mentioned, that's the cross-departmental um, collaboration. And then the role of the Committee on Climate Change as our independent scrutiny and advisory body is both to, invite, um, to offer uh, scientific expertise in the form of a climate change risk assessment evidence report, which you can also see in the blue boxes, uh, as well as uh, scrutinizing our actions and um, assessing how well we're doing. And that you can see in the progress report in the orange boxes. So looking at the climate change risk assessment, uh, the last one was published in 2017, and the next one will come five years after. Um, and looking at the right-hand side, uh, you can see a category a categorization of the top six risks which have been um, identified um, as the top risks that um, the UK is and will be facing from climate change. And you can see that they're very wide ranging and cross-cutting. 
uh, ranging from flooding and coastal change to drought to risk to health and productivity from extreme high temperatures and pests and diseases. And as I mentioned, these will be affecting um, sectors across the board. And so in response to the CCRA, as I mentioned, we have a national adaptation program or a NAP. Um, we have some quite fun acronyms. Um, and similar to the CCRA, the NAP is very broad ranging. So I lead on the natural environment chapter of the NAP, uh, but I speak very closely to my colleagues who lead on other chapters such as infrastructure, people in the built environment, business, industry, etc., to really think about those interlinkages and cascading risks that can be cross-sectoral. And um, to highlight, the NAP isn't uh, a static thing. We don't sort of publish it and then twiddle our thumbs for, for five years. Um, it's very much a case of working very closely with action owners within the NAP to make sure that those actions are being implemented, developed, um, improved on, et cetera. Although we are really seriously um, thinking about how we can improve our monitoring and uh, evaluation processes. So it's a constant learning curve. So just to um, mention some highlights from the previous NAP, um, there's a lot in terms of supporting the vital role of nature-based solutions. So, for example, uh, we're committed to uh, restoring or improving 500,000 hectares of wildlife-rich habitat. And so within that, um, there's, of course, the really important recognition of needing to think about how we can use these habitats um, to um, support ecosystems' resilience to climate change. So, for example, thinking about how connectivity can help species move in response to a changing climate. But then there's also a great deal of uh, ecosystem services and natural capital that we can benefit from from the natural environment in these habitats in order to develop um, resilience in other areas. So, for example, how can our freshwater ecosystems um, improve our water quality and our resilience to drought? And there's, of course, investment in managing on floods and in coastal erosions. Uh, so some of you um, will be aware that the government last week published a new government policy statement on floods. And then um, there's big emphasis on the NAP on local authority and community engagement. And that's on, a, that's on the recognition of um, the fact that this isn't just a government problem. We really need to be engaging and reaching out and empowering local authorities and local communities to think about how they also can be um, developing resilience to climate change risks. So, for example, last year, alongside ADEPT and the local adaptation advisory panel, um, we published a good practice guidance um, for local government. So on that same vein of needing an all of society approach, this is just an example of some of the ways in which we really try and um, uh, up, up that uh, outreach. So the CCRA that I mentioned and our UK climate change projections are not supposed to be just a government benefit. They're very much supposed to be tools that can be used by individuals, businesses, local authorities, organisations, etc., to look at the future climate projections and preempt what kind of actions they need to be doing in the future as well as what they already need to be doing. And then under the Climate Change Act, there's also an adaptation reporting power, and that allows us to invite or uh, oblige statutory undertakers to uh, report on what key climate change risks uh, are affecting their operations and what they're doing to try and address that. And those are published on our website. So there's uh, the ability for knowledge exchange, and they also help inform our climate change risk assessment. So there's that kind of feedback of not only engaging and, and, and working with um, organizations, but also learning from them. And then finally, of course, uh, COP26 next year is going to be a really key opportunity to be working with um, organizations, academics, individuals, etc to really have a kind of combined um, and ambitious and creative approach to climate and, um, adaptation and action ambition. So the linkages between climate change um, and heritage, and apologies, I might not be able to, to um, talk about this as eloquently as some of the other speakers on this panel, but uh, we, there is a strong link between the two. And on one hand, we know that climate change risk is um, a threat to um, crucial natural and cultural heritage assets. And this is recognized in the National Adaptation Program. So for example, in the People in Bi um, Built Environment uh, chapter, there's uh, a vision to ensure that the built environment and people, including built heritage, uh, are made resilient to um, climate change risks. And uh, Heritage England very astutely in their adaptation reporting um, cited the risks that climate change will have, not only on tangible built assets, but also the very institutions that support uh, education and research around heritage. So how will extreme weather events be affecting, for example, um, uh, on-site research, uh, staff travel, uh, access uh, 
of people to um, heritage assets, etc. But on the other hand, um, we have so much to gain from um, historic, cultural and natural heritage. Uh, so, for example, um, how can we integrate salt marshes and coastal habitats and intertidal vegetated areas into our more traditional concrete grey infrastructure used to buffer the effects of sea level rise, which we know will be increasing with climate change? And Heritage England is using soft capping, so using uh, soil and grass on um, some of their built heritage to buffer the effects of fluctuating temperature extremes. Oh, there's my little thing. Um, and, um, uh, which, and, and to reduce rain erosion. And they're also working in Appleby to um, uh, integrate traditional building structures into flood-stricken uh, properties. So we have so much to learn from um, historical heritage. And this also highlights the importance of not just tangible heritage, but more tacit forms of um, heritage through knowledge, skills, um, and um, the importance that these have in terms of developing resilience and management of uh, natural capital. Um, and so that's why we're also incredibly keen to be working with organizations and uh, collaborations such as the Climate Heritage Network, Heritage England, the British Irish Council, and organizations that are here today to really think about how we can share more knowledge in terms of tapping into those crucial um, heritage assets. So in my last final moments, I just quickly wanted to um, embed climate change within the wider context of the 25-year environment plan, which is the kind of strategic matrix of goals which DEFRA uses um, to think about improving the environment within a generation. And whilst climate change is one of the goals, we also try and have all of our fingers in as many pies as possible. Uh, so we also try and embed climate change within uh, the environmental hazards goal, thriving plants and wildlife, and beauty, heritage, and engagement with the natural environment. And I think that topic on uh, the natural environment is really key. Um, as has been really astutely um, pointed by Navin earlier, um, access to the natural environment, it can be incredibly unequal. And in the similar vein, the people who suffer the most from uh, disproportionately from environmental problems, um, such as air pollution, climate change, uh, the effects of pandemics, are often those with the least. And so there's a big emphasis in the 25 year environment plan to try and kind of think about how we can help people from all walks of society um, engage with nature better uh, to try and uh, garner those benefits that natural cap capital can offer us um, and try and dismantle this, this, this rhetoric that nature is something that's, that's elitist to actually thinking, no, it's something that should be for everybody. Um, so I've left a little list of um, different uh, campaigns and um, strategies that we have under the 25 year environment plan. It's far from exhaustive that people can have a look at um, once the slides are uh, shared um, uh, later after this event. But just to give a quick flavor, for example, um, so we recognize the importance of natural capital, for example, in mental health. So we've launched a work stream in collaboration with Public Health England and the NHS to explore how more people can be uh, connected to green spaces to support their mental health. So thinking about a more preventative health, um, approach to healthcare. And Natural England have recently public, um, updated their countryside code to have an emphasis on respect for nature, but also trying to break down some of those socioeconomic and racial barriers to nature. Um, we're also really um, keen to be engaging and learning from uh, young people. Um, so, for example, the Youth Steering Group was brought together by DCMS and the British Youth Council, and they um, produced a report um, working with BASE and DEFRA on how our environmental and climate policies um, could be um, improved to really um, engage and tap into the knowledge um, of young people as well as empower and include them in the story. Um, but I'm aware that I've probably um, overlapped my time quite a bit now, um, so I'll leave it at that and um, leave this slide for, um, for people to have a look at. Um, but thank you so much for letting me um, speak today, um, and I'm incredibly looking forward to, to, to hearing what the other panellists have um, got to say on this, on this topic.